So I'm um, going to present a work that is not only by myself, it's by a group of people, a uh, quite heterogeneous group of people, because you can find in there astronomers, you can find biosemantic people and computer scientists. So uh, the point in common of all of them is that um, Sorry. Okay. The point in common of all of, all of them is that they are con they think that preserving data is important, but they also concern about preserving the methods that were produced uh, to the methods that were used to produce that data. All right. So the method in, is not anything new. We have in experimental sciences, we have been hearing about the laboratory protocols for a long time, and typically the way to to perform a laboratory to do a pro laboratory protocol is that. The scientists just go to the lab, experiment with their materials, the, science, the different scientists do uh, their crazy experiments in there, then they annotate everything in the laboratory notebook, and finally when they want to share the method, what they do is to formalize uh, everything as a laboratory protocol, which is like a recipe that tells you what, how to accomplish the same experiment. Well, now that we have moved into a um, paradigm when we have a lot of computers, uh, many of these experiments are performed computational, computationally, and instead of um, having um, going to the lab and performing our experiments, what we do is we run our experiments in a cluster or in our computer. Instead of having a laboratory notebook, uh, we have a lot of log data logs. And finally, when we want to formalize the experiment for others to reuse, we do so uh, by creating a scientific workflow, which basically um, is a set of interconnected steps that have all the dependency of the different tools and software that you have used to produce your uh, data and your results. So, as uh, sharing data, sharing, uh, sharing the methods is uh, very useful because uh, first you can uh, make others reuse what other people, well, what you have been doing. Um, it increases your productivity because instead of having to run script by script, you can just re-execute the whole pipeline. Um, it helps uh, teaching new students to the lab because sometimes if you give them the paper, they are, well, it's a little bit difficult to reproduce. Instead, they, you give them the workflow and say, okay, these are the set of steps that have been used to produce the results in this paper. And also, you teach the people on your lab how to program modularly. Instead of developing a huge script that is a huge monolithic application that does everything, they learn how to separate their, their, their code in, in independent modular steps that uh, are um, linked together. It also uh, helps towards the standardization of methods within a research lab because, well, and this I know from experience that um, in some research labs, uh, well, different scientists do the same thing different ways. So sometimes when they want to collaborate among each other, they, they want to, but they find that they have been using different data formats or they have been, um, well, do, doing things differently. And, uh, well, this is also um, a way to push forward uh, doing things uh, the similar, in, in a similar manner. Um, and it also well has other benefits like debugging because well when you public, when you do things in a scientific workflow management system you can debug and see where the code failed in a particular step. Uh, it also helps paper writing and in general reproducibility. So how do we preserve these scientific workflows? There are a lot of um, uh, repositories that actually help you to to store your your workflow, but then. Um, in th these workflows have to be manually annotated and documented and the problem, the main problem is that you are missing the context. You have the workflow there, but when you go to, to reproduce it, you say, okay, where was the data what that was used to, to run this workflow with? And in general, all this burden is taken to the scientists by themselves, so what happens in the end is that workflows end up breaking. And this paper is a very interesting one where the, the scientists, what they did was to analyze over 90 workflows and they, they saw whether they could reproduce, it, reproduce them or not. And these are some of the reasons that they detected why they could not reproduce the majority of the workflows, which one of the, was, it was one of the shocking conclusions, right? Because, okay, we have all these uh, workflows or repository of workflows, but uh, we cannot reproduce them. <laughs> so um, the the first one is 
a little bit more difficult because, uh, well, uh, third party resources change, you can do very little about it. But the other three um, reasons was like uh, missing example data, a lack of documentation, and incomplete metadata of these workflows. So, what is our solution? Our solution was to provide a model which uh, we said, okay, let's aggregate everything into one single bundle and uh, this will provide the context necessary to, to actually be able to overcome these issues. Um, we call these research objects and we grounded this model uh, into well-known standards like the Ob uh, Open Archives Initiative Object Reuse and Exchange Model for Aggregations, the Open Annotation, which is now a W3C community group for um, handling the annotations that are made to the research subject, and finally the W3C provenance uh, standard uh, for handling the provenance of the executions of the workflows. So basically we have a semantically connected a bundle of things that are um, basically describe an experiment. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem, right? So now how do we do preserve research objects? Um, we said, okay, let's try instead of going to say, uh, well, we try to decompose the the um, the uh, reproducibility of a research of a research subject into three main levels. The first one is what we call descriptive reproducibility, and this is basically saying, okay, we may not have the means to ensure that this thing is going to execute in I don't know two years, but uh, we can document all the different steps that are part of this research subject to ensure that some domain expert at least will be able to know what is going on. The next one is to say, okay. Um, we are going to ensure that at least the workflow that is within this research subject is going to start uh, executing. It may fail later, um, the results that may produce may be different than the ones do you have to compare with, but at least you are able to start and compare with a sample data run within the research subject. And finally, it's the workflow results reproducibility in which um, you provide the means to um, actually um, make uh, the workflow runnable again and get uh, results that are consistent to the ones that um, you obtained in first place. I, I didn't say same results because, well, um, some web services change and if you rerun a workflow, you may obtain correct results that are different from the ones that you obtained in the original publication. So the way that we envision well, uh, a step forward towards achieving this uh, is through checklists. So we went to the data, Digital Creation Center uh, guidelines and we adapted some, some of these guidelines to, to the, these research subjects and workflow-centric research subjects. So the first document, which is available in Fixshare, by the way, if you want to have a look, um, uh, what uh, we did there is to identify 40 different aspects regarding documentation, goals, results, metadata, archival of research subjects, and um, tick uh, which of them should be necessary to match any of the three main levels that we identified before. And on the second document, um, which is basically a workflow conservation plan, is an adaptation of the, uh, data work, uh, the data conservation plan by the DCC into workflows offering guidelines of the different steps and how you may achieve doing all these steps, basically. So this is a small example. The checklists are already being used in a, um, an application which is called the Research Object Digital Library by the um, Supercomputer Center in Poznan. And we, uh, they are used in two different ways. The first one is to match uh, to uh, these three profiles that we identify. So you say, okay, to, to be able to match to this profile, you need this uh, tick on the checklist or not. And the second one is um, to measure a little bit the quality of the research subject. So they have a quality model based on the resources that are aggregated and described in the research subject. And on the right uh, side, well, it cannot be seen very well, but it's just um, the adaptation of the DCC saying, okay, uh, what would you do? Uh, how will you collect uh, workflows? Well, you have to consider these questions and this is the guidance that we offer uh, to, to achieve this. So, um, in conclusion, um, what I, the message that I want you to have is that we have data is very important as we have all seen, 
the methods are really important, but the context that links data and methods is critical as well in my view. So um, this context, a way to, to represent it is through research subjects and uh, the way that we envision that a research subject should be measured is through these three levels of reproducibility. Uh, the first one is by being able to provide enough documentation about a research subject. The second one is to providing the means so to the research subject at least starts the execution and you are able to compare uh, with previous runs that the results are okay. And finally, it's the ability to obtain the same results within the research subject. Uh, we have proposed checklists as a first step towards achieving this. And we think is well, it's a nice starting point, but I'm sure that there will be more things necessary in the future because this is just, uh, well, something that it's also getting started. Um, so finally, I would like to encourage you to have a look at the researchaddit.org uh, webpage, um, where all the to related tools, initiatives, etc., uh, are listed there and has a very beautiful layout. So go ahead and have a look. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dan. So I, I kept it short because I know that everyone wants to go to the cafe. Three or four. Any questions for Daniel? Uh, yeah, I have some. Well, the, the first one, the, the simplest, because you know that's. Uh, is the following. Have you uh, started thinking of how introducing this into a uh, peer review methodology? Um, like, for example, integration with the journal that would accept research objects, or um, that would leave uh, the peer reviewers actually the ability to reproduce easily the experiment thanks to the fact that uh, the paper is distributed together with the research object? Um, we are starting. Um Doing uh, associating also these these research subjects for um, well working with like extracting metadata from the papers as well, but we haven't in, thought yet about or started uh, talking about journals about how this could be integrated. But well, it's something that has to be done in the future because well, it would be very useful also for the reviewer to have all this information regarding the the, the object. I mean, it's necessary. But assume that the journal would like to. Mm -hmm allow researchers to upload research objects. Would you be able to serve the journal with all the tools in the integrable in their system to reproduce the experiment? Because this is what I think you should sell. Hmm. So if you if you sell these to journals, mm -hmm. platforms, I think they would appreciate that. Right? So if you give them the chance to offer the reviewers the ability to reproduce an object as long as it's uploaded as a research object in the platform, they, the journals would really appreciate that. I think there's some business behind it. Yeah. Think about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, uh, actually, we have some people working in our lab into towards like going on this whole reproducibility as a bundle. But uh, well, there are a lot of issues to be solved there. Uh, to, to be solved there, yet, and the, it always depends on the domain, on the tools, uh, etc. No, but uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so you're right. <laughs> okay. Thank you.